video, we're going to be classifying amino acids based on the polarity of side chains. In a previous video, we talked about how one amino acid differ from another one by the presence of different R group. And in this session, we're going to be classifying different amino acids based on the polarity of the side chains, whether they are polar, or nonpolar, or acidic and basic. So let's focus on the amino acids that has a nonpolar side chain. So being a nonpolar, non those side chains are going to be hydrophobic, which means they don't really like water, and uh, the intramolecular for interactions they're going to be making would be the London dispersion forces. So the first one we have in our list is the glycine, and every single amino acid is going to have a name, a three-letter code, and a one-letter code. You may wonder why we really need these three-letter code and one-letter codes. If you have hundreds and thousands of amino acids in one protein, and if you want to write down the, the sequence of those amino acids to specify that particular protein, you don't really have time to write down the full names, and that's when you write down the three-letter codes, but most likely the one-letter code is used in those cases. Out of all the amino acids, another important fact is glycine is the only one that's going to have the alpha carbon to be achiral, like this particular alpha carbon in every single amino acid is going to be chiral except in glycine, where glycine has two hydrogens attached to this particular alpha carbon, and because of that, it's not going to be chiral. So you really don't have D or L in case of glycine. The rest of these amino acids will have a D form and an L form, or an R form and an S form. So the difference between the glycine and the alanine is just the presence of this uh, methyl group that we have down there in the form of R group. And obviously this is going to be, this alpha carbon is going to be chiral in this particular case because of four different groups attached to it. And then as we move along, the difference between the alanine and the valine is the presence of this isopropyl group. And then we can just kind of move along and see what differences you have in the side chains along those amino acids. So this next one, which is leucine, is going to have an isobutyl group. Um, isoleucine is going to have a secbutyl group. And then you got this uh, phenyl alanine. That's because... Uh, it's kind of similar to the alanine, but then you got this phenyl group attached to it, so that's why it's called a phenyl alanine. And the symbol of the three-letter code is PHE, and the one-letter code is F. Just because it starts with P doesn't necessarily mean its one-letter code is going to be P. Their one-letter code may slightly changes and may not match with the first letter of their name. So you want to be familiar with their names, their three-letter codes, and one-letter codes. And in some classes, you may have to actually memorize all these structures and memorize the three letters in one-letter code. And then we got uh, this methionin, and then we got this proline, and then this last one I have is tryptophan. So the reason why they're all kind of put in the class of uh, hydrophobic, just because they got a lot of these carbons in a big carbon chains on them and really don't have any polar grips attached to them. And even if they do have polar grips, like in this case, you may argue that tryptophan has a nitrogen, which will create an electronegativity difference. But then this rest of the grip is so big that it kind of takes over the polarity. All right. In addition to that, this proline is the only amino acid that's going to be in, that's going to have the side chain linked to the amine, as a result, it's going to be found in a ring form. All right, so due to this proline being in a ring form, it's going to have the most restriction in terms of the movement. The rest of the amino acids kind of free to move around through a single bond rotation, but proline is one of them that's going to have a very restricted movement. Let's talk about amino acids that's going to have neutral side chain, uh, polar neutral side chains, and they're going to be hydrophobic, and uh, they are going to be capable of making either hydrogen bonds and dipole-dipole interactions. Okay, so serine is the first one we have here, and obviously um, 
the what really makes the serine polar is the presence of this OH group on there. The difference between serine and the threonine here is having an extra metal group on the th on the threonine, and then we got this tyrosine as well that's got the OH group in there. So all those three guys are going to be capable of making hydrogen bonds because of the presence of OH there. The cysteine has an SH, and the cysteine doesn't really make the hydrogen bond when we talk about the side chain, but however, it's polar and it can make an dipole-dipole interactions, and that's why we still consider this a polar side chain amino acid. Another important fact of cysteine is a lot, there is a lot of cysteine in the hairs, and uh, if if you accidentally burn the hairs and you you smell like sulfur, something sulfur burning, that's because of the cysteine kind of being a burning in, in the hairs. For the girls, if if you want to have curly hairs or straight hairs, that has to do a lot with the cysteine because this can make uh, so-called you know, disulfide bonds and you can make uh, the disulfide bonds accordingly and you can get those curls however you want. Asparagine is another one. Obviously the side chain has an amide functional group on here. So both the asparagine and glutamine is going to have an amide functional group. The difference between the asparagine and the glutamine is how many carbons you have in the side chain. You got only one carbon in asparagine before your amide group shows up, but in glutamine you got two carbons before your amide group shows up, so that's the only difference. Let's talk about some of the amino acids that has polar acidic side chains, or another way of saying their side chain are going to have an acid group, which is going to be the COOH, and they're still going to be hydroph hydrophilic, be able to make a hydrogen bond. One of them is called aspartate, and the other one is going to be glutamate, and as the name specifies, it kind of sounds similar to these asparagine and glutamine. Aspartate comes from the asparagine. Once you hydrolyze the asparagine, you can get aspartate, and once you hydrolyze the glutamine, you can get glutamate. Now, I have written those in the form of uh, depronated. That's because all these amino acids are made at a physiological pH where both of those acids group, group, groups are going to be depronated and your amine group is going to be pronated. So that's why I have this side chain to be COO minus. So that's one way of writing it, COO minus. But if you lower the pH of the solution, then this particular, these particular amino acids going to have COOH in their side chains, and that's why they are called an acidic polar amino acids. Okay. In addition to that, you also can have polar basic amino acids, and uh, in polar basic amino acids, you're going to have an amine as your side chain. So there's going to be an amine group. That's what's going to be creating the base there. Uh, three common ones are going to be histidine, lysine, and arginine. In histidine, you have this nitrogen right there that's going to be responsible for making it a basic side chain. And then lysine, you got this NH2 group right there. In arginine, you have this NH2 that's going to be making this a base. Now, in every single case, I have these nitrogens to be protonated. And that's because, remember, at physiological conditions, your nitrogen is going to be existing in the protonated form, just like you have the nitrogen on the main chain there. And that's why I have those nitrogens bit with extra hydrogen, and as a result, they got a positive charge on it. But as soon as you increase the pH of the solution or these amino acids, this nitrogen will eventually get depronated and will not have any hydrogen attached to them. Now, how do you really write down the general structure of peptides? So I have a little peptide here, and it's going to be showing uh, the different amino acids that's going to be in there. So in every peptide structure, you can count how many amino acids you have. So you, in this particular case, this is the first one. I have second, third, and four. So it's since it has four 
amino acids in there, you can call this tetrapeptide. If you have two amino acids, you call it dipeptide. If you have three amino acids, you have you call it tripeptide. For five amino acids, you you call it pentapeptide, and so on. But once you get you know over so many amino acids, you just call it polypeptide. And that's how most of those functional proteins are. They have so many amino acids and you just call those polypeptides and the other common name for polypeptides is gonna be just proteins. We will classify the proteins in a different video, but here I wanna kinda of show the general structure of uh, the peptides and be able to recognize so-called peptide bond. So now we can clearly see here this first amino acids I have and on the left side, we got this N group here. So we call this N terminal. And on the right side, you can kind of clearly see there's an COO minus. So that's going to be your C terminal. And uh, what type of this amino acid going to be on the first one? Well, clearly it's going to be the glutamate. Okay, so I write down the three letters code for glutamate. It's going to be GLU. And the one letter code for that is going to be E. And then the second amino acid is going to be alanine. So it's ALA, and one letter code is A. And this third amino acid is going to be valine. The three letter code is VAL, one letter code is V. And then this last one is going to be the glycine, three letter code is GLY, one letter code is G. So one way of, uh, if I don't want to write down the structure or draw out the structure, one way of representing this amino acid or this peptide, rather it's going to be writing GLU and then bonding with ALA, and then you got this valine, and then you got this glycine. Or I can also write it in the form of uh, one letter code, so in that case it would have been E, A, V, and G. And sometimes you may just uh, see books just writing something like this, not even showing up the bond there. They could just write it as E, A, B, and G. And that just ma means you got glutamine, you got glutamate, alanine, valine, and glycine in that particular order. So order really matters when you're writing the sequence of these proteins. The bond that's going to be made between the carbonyl of the first amino acid and the amine of the second amino acid is going to be called in a peptide bond. So it's very important to be able to recognize where your peptide bonds are going to be. So all these green bonds that I have showing, um, showing here are going to be the peptide bonds. If they do give you the sequence, how would you know that you have, if the left side is going to be your N terminal or the left side is going to be the C terminal? And sometimes they would specify that the left side is the N terminal and the right side is the C terminal. And sometimes they may just write it out like this. You have NH2 written on the left side and then the COOH written on the right side. That just literally means, okay, the right side is going to be the C terminal and your left side is going to be the N terminal. All right, so this is your general presentation of an peptide, be able to recognize your N terminal, C terminal, and peptide bond, and 20 different types of amino acids characterized or classified based on the side chains, whether being polar, nonpolar, basic, and acidic. If you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.